Dear students, a warm welcome to VTU Sikshana program. Uh, I am Soprakash, Associate Professor and heading the Department of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning in Sri Sai Ram College of Engineering, Anekal, Bengaluru. Today, I am here to uh, discuss about the Module 4 of Artificial Neural Network, Attractor Neural Network. Let us go through into the topic. This module which is going to cover the syllabus of attractor neural network in that associative learning, attractor associative learning, a linear associative memory, off-field network and its applications of this off-field network, brain state in a box neural network, stimulated annealing, Boltzmann machine, bidirectional associative memory. These are the things we are going to see in this video. Before getting into this particular topic, let me aware about what is the learning objective of this module. We need to understand the concepts and techniques of a neural network through the study of the most important neural network models. So that is going to be our learning objective of this module 4, Attractor Neural Network. Let me get into the introduction. What do you mean by attractor neural network? In general, an attractor neural network is a network of nodes, that is, a neurons in a biological network, often recurrently connected, whose time dynamics settles to a stable pattern. That patterns may be stationary or time varying, example, a cyclic. So, in today's human memory is an associative. So human memories are going to be associative. We recall facts that the information by invoking a chain of associations with a complex web of embedded knowledge stored in our brains. Sometimes a chain of thought can be generated through a conscious or unconscious reasoning. Example, a fragrance of a flower evokes a pleasant memory of the past or a name of a friend suddenly creates a surge of emotions. So the entire experience are going to be recalled in the complete richness of fact on a simple cue and within a fraction of second. So associations either involves the linking of one stimulus to another or a behavioral response. So memories are laid down through a combination of complex learning mechanisms which involves plastic change in the brain. So to provide a substract or as to build a model neuroscience, researchers as revealed a synapse that is responsible for the way a long term memories get laid down in our brain. Let us see about the associative learning. The associative learning occurs through the association of two previously unrelated stimulus and includes the reinforcements. So associative learning is investigated using a neural network and concepts based on learning automata. The behavior of a single decision maker containing a neural network is studied in a random environmental using reinforcement learning. So the objective is to determine the optimal action corresponding to a particular state. So uh, this is an uh, what I can say it is a, a psychological concept. Uh, let me discuss about the example for this associative learning. So uh, if someone puts their hand upon a stove, hot stove and hurts themselves, they may learn to associate how hot stove and with the pain which have been made, which have hurted the hand. So and they are therefore being uh, conditioned not to put their hand on them. It is a psychological concept as I said over there. Let me see the hippocampus. 
the hippocampus what is hippocampus the hippocampus in our brain is one structure that is responsible for the storage of declarative memory the data which is going to be get stored in our brain so research into the structure and mechanism of operation of hippocampus neurons has revealed mechanisms that are required for associative learning coming to this long term potentiation and hips postulate so neurons in the hippocampus readily display long term and permanent increase in activity with certain patterns of stimulations so this figure which is going to uh, portray the essential region of this hippocampus with which concern for the moment the structure of this mechanism of operation of specialized neurons are called pyramidal this pyramidal cells are going to be get present over here this pyramidals so the structure and mechanism of this operation of this specialized neurons the pyramidal cells that resides in a region called ca1 resides the region called ca1 so in this figure there are three major pathways with an arrow indicates the particular direction of signal flow of this particular pathway number 1 number 2 and number 3 so the preferent fiber which is going to be a pathway runs to granule cells into the deterrent region granule cells into this deterrent region the granule cells in turn send axons that forms the mossy fiber pathway to cell in the ca3 region and the ca3 cell projects axons onto detentrates of the predominal sorry the pyramidal cell in the ca1 region this is going to be transferred from here to there so the extensive research which reveals that a brief high frequency stimulus train to any one of these three pathways which leads to an enduring increase in the excitatory post synaptic potential es epsp of this ca1 pyramidal neurons so the strength of this epsp increases in response to the stimulus strain and this change can last for anything from hours to weeks this facilitations of this epsp is referred as a long term potentiation this is going to be called as ltp abbreviated as ltp let us see the three major pathways at we come across over there preferent fiber pathway as i said which runs to an granule cell in the deterrent region then granule cell in turn send the axons that forms the mossy fiber pathway to the cell in the ca3 region and the ca3 region cells projects axons onto dendrites of the pyramidal cell in the ca1 region this long term potentiation as i said the strength of this epsp increases in the response to the stimulus strain and this changes can last for anything from hours to weeks and apart from this it is most interesting that the ca1 ltp displays three important properties the first property is going to be called as cooperativity the second one associativity third one specificity specificity what is cooperativity the ca1 ltp cannot be produced by activating only one fiber so instead of that it needs a minimum number of fibers must be activated together to achieve the ltp 
this is going to be called as cooperativity coming to the next one next property associativity when both strong and weak excitatory inputs arrive in the same dendritic region of a pyramidal cell the weak input gets potentiated if it is activated in association with the strong one this is going to be called as associativity the third important property of ca1 ltp is nothing but specificity this ltp is specific to the dendrites where it is going to be get produced this is the specificity so these are the three important properties of ca1 ltp cooperativity associativity and specificity coming to the next one hepps postulate what is hepps postulate when an axon of a cell a excites the cell b and repeatedly or persistently take part in firing it some growth process of metabolic change that takes place in one or both cells so the a's efficacy as one of the cell firing the b is going to be get increased this is known as post this is known as epps postulate so the important and ramification of epps postulate cannot be over emphasized this principle underlies a large number of neural network model it motivates a different forms of a learning loss directly or indirectly so the essential idea of that emerge from this hepps statement is that the synaptic changes that occur is proportional to the conjunctive activity of the pre and post synaptic neurons the next question is why is this conjunctive or coincidence activity required so to understand about the conjunction or the coincidence activity the requirement we are going to move on to the next one that's going to be called as nmda synapse synapse as a model of ltp so the operation of a special uh, reactors on the dendrites called n methylene d aspartam this is going to be named as nmda receptors the axons from ca3 neurons that terminates on ca1 neurons which uses glumate as their neurotransmitters so the figure shows the particular nmda synapses a model for the ltp figure a and figure b two are going to be there one is blocked one more is unblocked so let me discuss in detail about this particular thing nmda and non nmda receptors so the figure shows that ca1 neuron has both nmda as well as non nmda receptors to which glumate binds so this is nmda receptors and this is non nmda receptors nmda receptors and non nmda receptors so here the non nmda channel operates like an ordinary chemically gated channel that opens when the glumate neurotransmitters binds to the designated site on the channel let me see about this the axons from the ca3 neurons that terminates on ca1 neurons by using the glumate as their neurotransmitters so the ca1 neurons have both as we have discussed nmda and non nmda receptors to which the glumate binds over here so the nmda nmda receptor channel is an uniquely double gated channel it is usually blocked it is usually blocked by the magnesium ions which is going to be usually blocked by the magnesium ions initially this channel remains blocked even when glumate binds to it so that coming to the next one the unblocking and nmda channel so the non 
NMDA channel operates like an ordinary chemically gated channel that opens when the glutamate neurotransmitter binds to the designated site on the channel. So, the opening of the channel allows the flow of sodium ions into and potassium ions out of the postcinematic dendrites. So, if you are going to see about this, you can see about this one. So, this region which is going to deal about that sodium ions are going to be allowed and the potassium ions are going to be get got out. So, sodium ions are going to be in and potassium ions are going to be out. So, this retrograde messenger transports this particular information over here. So, this is an unblocked stage. So, the unblocking an NMDA channel which is going to allow sodium ions to in into and the potassium to out, potassium ions to out. So, this is a actual thing which is going to happen over here. So, this eventually leads to a depolarization of this post cinematic dentic region. This is going to be get depolarized. So, the depolarization actually if you are going to see about that one, when glumate binds to the receptor and the post cinematic cell is going to be sufficiently depolarized by a strong cooperative inputs from this pre cinematic neurons. So, the depolarization is going to be achieved, the depolarization is going to be get achieved with the particular process. So, uh, on the other hand, if you are going to see about that, the NMD receptor channel is going to be uniquely double gated as we have come across over there. It is usually blocked by magnesium ions and so initially the channel remains blocked even when glumate binds to it. So, magnesium ions depends or decouples from the channel only if the post cinematic cell is going to be sufficiently depolarized. Therefore, an NMDA channel can become unblocked only when the glumate binds to the receptor and the post cinematic uh, synaptic cell is going to be sufficiently depolarized by the strong cooperative inputs from the post cinematic neurons. So, depolarization is going to be achieved only when uh, many non NMD receptors open in the response to the simultaneous firing of many presynaptic inputs since unblocking this receptors allows an influx of sodium ions into the post synaptic cell. Let me discuss about the next one induction of LTP. What is induction of LTP? The influx of calcium is essential. The influx of calcium is going to be essential. So, the influx of calcium comes through NMDA channel and not from the regular voltage gated calcium channels that are usually prevalent in the cell membrane of this dendritic shaft. So, activation of an NMDA channel is thus restricted to the synaptic that are active, that are active. So, this removes the activation of this non-NMDA channel depolarizes the dendritic spines and this removes the magnesium ion blockade which allows calcium to enter. So, Synaptic action is thus restricted to the synapses that are active over here. So, the influx of calcium initiates the enduring enhancement of synaptic transmissions by activating two calcium dependent protein kinases which is going to be called as calmodulin cal kinases protein kinases C. This protein kinases become persistently active. So, this first stage is going to be called as this induction of LTP. So, this first stage which is going to create the evidence that suggests the influx of calcium comes through an MDA channel 
and not from the regular voltage gated channels and the activation of this non NMDA channel depolarization makes the synaptic action that are to be get active and the influx of this calcium initiates the protein kinases of these two different types of proteins. So, this stage is going to be called as induction of LTP. Next one, maintenance of LTP, long term potentiation. This phase requires enhanced presynaptic transmitter release. If the induction of LTP requires a post event and the maintenance requires a presynaptic event that there must be some message that goes back from the post to presynaptic neuron. This message is going to be carried or carried by a calcium activated retrograde transmitter which is going to be an nitric oxide that diffuses from post synaptic region neuron to the presynaptic region neuron. So, in this presynaptic neuron the retrograde transmitter activates one or more second messages in the presynaptic terminal that enhances the transmitter release of neurotransmitter. This is going to be called as the maintenance of LTP, maintenance of long term potentiation. Moving to the next one, attractor association memory. So, before going to this attractive association memory, let me summarize this brief discussion with the observation of LTP in CA1 neuron, which might be using two associative mechanisms. Abian conjective learning and activity dependent presynaptic facilitation. So, although the Hebian learning as caught on which neural network theories in a big way, so the idea of retrograde transmission remains largely unexploited in the literature. Let me see about associative memory. What is associative memory? A memory is a content addressable structure that maps specific input representations to a specific output representations. So, it is uh, a system that associates two patterns uh, for example, x comma y such that when one is encountered the other can be recalled. So, as we are aware about that an associative memory is a content addressable structure that maps a specific input representations to a specific output representations. So, this associative memory is also called as or known as content addressable memory CAM. What is the use of this associative memory? An associative memory can be treated as a memory unit whose saved information can be recognized for approach by the content of the information itself instead of by an address or memory location. So, usually this memory is going to be treated as the information storage area which can be recognized for an approach by the content of the information ok. Instead of the memory location or address or the memory location we are going to make use of the content of the information itself it is going to be get identified that is going to be called as associative uh, memory. Uh, what do you mean by associative learning? The associative learning in this context of Hebb's rule is more formal uh, sense. Uh, Hebb learning principle implies that the synaptic dynamics are going to be gone by a conjunction of pre and post synaptic activities. So, and which leads to a powerful associative memories that uh, uh, relate or associate one concept of idea with another. Let me discuss in detail about this. So, attractor neural network associative memory as I said Hebbian learning principle which implies that the synaptic dynamics are governed by a conjunction of 
presynaptic activities and postsynaptic activities and which leads to powerful association or associative memories that relate or which is going to get associate one concept or idea with the another. This is going to be an actual attractor neural network associative memory. Let me deal about the memories and minimo of a Lyapunova function. What is Lyapunova function? This function is going to be giving a dynamics of the system. Let me discuss about that one. So the dynamics of the systems can be visualized by imagining some high dimensional undulating energy surface which generated from a Lyapunova function. So here which is going to deal about the function in two different dynamics as gravitational dynamics and neural network dynamics. Let me see about gravitational dynamics first. The gra uh, gravitational dynamics which deals with an, a rubber sheet analogy. In this way, the undulations can be pinched onto a rubber sheet rolls to be closed a uh, local minimum under the influence of gravity that is going to be dealt as a rubber sheet analogy. Neural network dynamics states of the network which is going to maps to the point on the Lyapunova energy surface. So each point on this energy surface corresponds to point in the state space. So an attractor neural network falls on an energy state that represents the closest local minimum under the influence of the governing vector field. So as we are aware about that, the neural network dynamics are going to be uh, represents the closest local minimum under the influence of the governing vector field. Let me discuss about neural network dynamics in detail. An attractor neural network falls on an energy state that represents the closest local minimum under the influence of the vector field. So the vector field governed by a structure of connections, the weights and the nature of the signal function. So this network states evolves in time until the local minimum is going to be get reached after which the state stops evolving further. So as we recall such a evolution state is going to be guaranteed for the system that follow the Cohen Grossberg structure, Cohen Grossberg structure. So which admits a Lyapunova function that is going to be bounded below and whose time derivation is going to be negative definite. Let me see about a broad objective of this particular system. To perform useful computations in an attractor neural network, point of local minimum at which the network state stabilizes is to be interpreted as a memory of the system. An input which is going to be allows or an input vector which is going to be get set the initial state of the neural network which is represented by a, a point of energy surface which is going to be represented by a point of energy surface. So given a Q or an initial input vector the initial state can be represented by a point in the energy surface. So the network states revolves in time till the system hits the energy minimum and this final state is recalled as the memory vector. So therefore the minimum energy point of this Lyapunova surface have to be mapped to desired memory states. Let me see about the associative memory model. What is the associative memory model? 
This associative memory model deals the class of neural network model designed by primarily to perform the functions of associative memory. So, this model is going to be designed by primarily to perform the functions of associative memory. So, associative memory maps data from an input space in an output space from an unknown domain point to a known range points. So, as we are going to see about this figure in this an input space which is going to be dealt as x and output space are going to be dealt as y and it is going to be dealt with the associative memory. So, as we are aware about that which is going to transfer which is going to get transfer or which is going to map the data from the input space into the associative memory and from the associative memory to the output space okay which is going to be a mapping from an unknown domain points to a known domain or known range points. This is going to be called as associative memory model. So, this memory learns an underlying associations from the training data set, training data set. So, this association memory model maps points from an input space into a fixed set of points into an output space. So, the memory model consideration in this present study have their origin in the additive neural dynamics and are nonlinear in nature. By this means that connection strengths are programmed, yeah, uh, what I can say that yeah, prior based or priority based on associations that are to be encoded in the system. So, no learning uh, takes place before the operation of the system. Sometimes such memories are referred to as a matrix associative memory. So, here this memory is going to learn an underlying associations from a training data set. Such a way it is going to do its operation. Let me see about the next one matrix associative memory. What is matrix associative memory? Example, if I am going to take A comma B, so I can take A i and B i is one of the programmed memories, then B i is called the associate of A i, B i is going to be called as the associate of A i. Some input vectors A dash produces an output or a response vector B dash. If A dash is going to be close to some encoded associations of A, then B dash that is generated should be close to the B. Such a way it is going to be get created over here. So, this associations to be performed or programmed need not to be restricted to indeed as we show ahead in this simple example. The inputs and associations can be uh, real numbers also. So, associations are going to be encoded into the systems using an outer product correlation matrices where each entry in a matrix stores a piece of every matrix associative memory which encodes the associations. So, this which is going to encode this associations over here we can see about that a i comma b i when which is going to be taken into a i is a subset of b to the power of n and b i is a subset of b to the power of m then into a connection matrix then this is going to be called as matrix associative memory. So, as we said that this outer product correlation matrix are going to be get taken care into that one where each entry in a matrix is going to be stored a piece of every matrix associative memory which is going to be get encoded into this associations. Let me see about the types of associative memory, hetero associative memory and auto associative memory. 
What is heteroassociative memory? First, we will see about the heteroassociative memory. When A i and B i are in the different spaces of A i, then A i is going to be a subset of B n and B i is going to be a subset of B to the power of m, then this memory is going to be called as heteroassociative memory when both are going to be there in the different spaces that then it is going to be called as dealed as an heteroassociative memory. Coming to the next one auto associative memory. When A i comma B i are in the same space of A i, same space of A i, we have to think about this different spaces and same, same space of A i. So, this two are going to be the key points to remember about the types of associative memory as heteroassociative memory and autoassociative memory. So, this autoassociative memory when A i comma B i are in the same space of A i, then B i is going to be the subset of B to the power of n, then this memory is going to be called as autoassociative, which is going to be called as auto associative. When A i and B i are in the same space of A i, B i is going to be subset of B to the power of n, then this memory is going to be called it associative memory, which associates a vector with itself. Whether the system is auto associative or an hetero associative, the memory of this vectors that are to be associated is stored in the connections of the network. So, the associative memory model which is going to enjoy the property such as uh, fault tolerance and when they are when they are associative and auto associative they are able to solve the patterns which is going to have a completion problem. Let me discuss about the next one a two layer feed forward neural network associative memory. This figure if you are going to see about that it shows a simple association memory which is going to generate it by a two layered neural network, two layered neural network. So, which has an input vector, connection matrix and an output vector. This figure has a two layer of neurons, one which receives input vector and one which generates output vector. So, the two layers are going to be assumed to be connected through an n cross m connection matrix of w. So, if all the neurons are assumed linear then for an input vector a that is presented to the network the activation of the, uh, the signal which is going to be a vector B of the output neurons, which can be rewritten uh, 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 compactly, we can rewritten this into a matrix form of B is equal to A transpose of W. B is equal to A transpose of W. Here, the association of B with A is generated through the connection matrix W. So, the association between B and A both are going to be made in the form of W, the connection matrix W. So, this is an example of a linear memory. Additionally, the complexity can be introduced into the operation of the same network by employing a nonlinear signal function at the input as well as at the output. So, in such cases, an additional complexity which can be introduced into this operation of the same network by employing a nonlinear signal function which is going to create an input as well as the output. In such case, this expression is going to be changed into B is equal to dou b is equal to dou a transpose w. So, here if you are going to see about that one, 
the association between A and B are going to be dealt in a different way with do function and which is going to create it with the W, the complex, the connection matrix. So, where we assumed that the signal a vector A is going to be generated using a nonlinear function of the activations in the input layer. In this case, the memory is going to be a nonlinear. Note that the neural network architecture portrayed in figure in this figure, which allows the activations to flow uniform, sorry, unidirectional from the input layer to the output layer. So, the input vector which is going to be creating an information and that is going to be flowing through that one. So, again the input vector which is going to be flowing through this and it is going to be going over there. So, it shows that the figure which allows the activations to flow unidirectionally from the input layer to the output layer of the neurons. Let me see about the next one, two layer feed forward neural network associations which is going to be having the same association for this associative memory which has the two neurons are going to be there and an input vector, output vector, connection matrix have been created over there. Here if you are going to see about this, this is going to be an associative memory generated which is going to be employed a feedback, which is going to be employed a feedback. So, a further level of complexity in this operation of the same network can be introduced by incorporating this feedback. So, as shown in this figure, a reverse set of connections allows signal from the output layer of neurons to flow back into the input layer output vector data which is going to get flowing back to the input vector. So, this connection allows a signal from the output layer of the neurons to flow back into the input layer thereby modifying their activation levels. So, this introduces the dynamics into the network operation. Move on to the next one, one layer feed forward neurons network which is going to be related with the associative memory. As we have seen that the same thing has been there here also the associative memory which is going to be generated employed by a feedback, employed by a feedback. What is the difference? A single layer of neuron feeds back to itself through a single set of connections generating an auto associative architecture. As we are going to see about that one, the output vector as we have seen in the previous one, the output vector is going to be fed back the neurons to the input vector. Whereas here, the output vector is going to be get fed back into the input vector the same way, but a connection vector is going to be an only one feed forward neural. It is a one layer, it does not have two layers, it is a one layer. So, note that a one layer receives an input vector which it transmits along the weighted connections which is going to be get presented by a weighted matrix to the second layer that generates the output vector. In this case, in that first case there is no feedback whereas this architecture could be either a two layer network, neural network or a single layer neural network. This matrix is going to be get formulated as per the process. Move on to the next one, HEPS encoding scheme. What is HEPS? HEPS association matrix. Importantly, since the association is going to be embedded within the connection matrix, the question is going to be asked how do you communicate the connection matrix? How do we compute the connection matrix? Recall that 
The Hebb's postulate states that change in synaptic efficacy is going to be proportional to the conjunction or the product or of the pre or post synaptic neuron signals. So, we construct the matrix W in accordance with this principle. To formalize this idea, we are going to consider a two layers of Fx and Fy of an n comma m neurons with a connection matrix W. If we assume that the weight matrix is going to be constructed using an Hebbian's learning, it generates weights values in accordance with the product of the presynaptic and the postsynaptic activities of the neurons as follows. This is going to be a generalized Hebb's rule which is going to deal with dou w i j is equal to the Hebbian rule function which is going to deal with an a i comma b j and this modifies the synapse in accordance with the product of the presynaptic activity with the activity of the postsynaptic neuron which deals about w is equal to a1 b1 comma a1 b2 comma a1 b3 up to a1 bm such a way it's going to make a2 b1 a2 b2 a2 b3 etc to a2 bm and such a way it's going to make a n b1 a n b2 a n b3 etc to a n bm which is going to provide the w is equal to a into b transpose so the outer product is going to be a column into row vector which generates a matrix and inner product is a row into a column vector which generates a scalar. So, the Hebb's conjunctional learning rule should be clear from the above matrix that the weight V W i j that connects neurons i to f x to neuron j of f y is the product of the respective signals and a i and b i of the both the neurons. So, the associations a comma b is thus encoded into the matrix and this forms a conjunctional learning underlies in the attractor neural networks. So, I am going to summarize this video lecture. We have come across with the introduction of attractor neural network and we have seen associative learning in that associative memory and the memory models and the types of associative memory, hetero associative memory and auto associative memory and finally Hebb's encoding schema. So, this video is going to continue. Thank you.